What happens when you mix over 30 years of iconic photos featuring hundreds of legendary musicians and then add stories to them all? You get a treasure for the ages. Welcome, I'm Barry Kibrick, and my guest is the acclaimed rock and roll photographer Jimmy Steinfeld. From Spin Magazine to the cover of Rolling Stone, many of Jimmy's photographs are etched in our psyche, and now he shares many of the stories behind those images. Jimmy, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you. This is one of the most beautiful books on rock and roll I had on. I told you Bill Bentley, who did a book about yes. fan photography. But when you have one of the great rock and roll photographers, thank you, pal, for joining us today. Oh, it was a pleasure. Thank you. It's so mm. nice to be here, Barry. My pleasure. My pleasure. I want to start because the way you started, it's 1982, and you're at the Met Center in Bloomington, Minnesota, and the bug hits you. That's correct. Um, I just brought my $100 camera with me at that time, and uh, I was just a fan. And I photographed uh, Stevie Nicks was the concert. And I stood on a chair in about the 20th row and just took some pictures and crossed my fingers that they would turn out, and they turned out really good. So I got bitten by the bug when I saw that I could do that. Well, that's what happens. You went home, actually, and you developed them yourselves. You were that kind of a photographer. You weren't a snap-and-shoot kind of a guy. You were a photographer. And it's in the darkroom that you actually, it, it, it's sort of like Stevie Nicks comes to life and your career comes to life. Correct. And you also were a musician, so you had a certain sort of a feeling for the whole spirit of rock and roll, and more than rock and roll, music in general. Yes, that's correct. I'd been playing guitar since I was maybe 10 years old. And then I actually stopped playing for many years, and I kind of regret that looking back. But um, I always had the musician uh, interest and, and some ability there. And then years later, I started writing songs too, but that's a whole other story. Well, you begin going then to as many concerts as you can, taking photos, and you finally get a paid job when someone sees, I guess, your work, at, but it's a photograph of the Go-Go's. That's correct. Uh, the Go-Go's had just completed their uh, last album uh, before they had a reunion years later. And a friend of mine had known about the photography I was doing, and he hired me to do some publicity photos for them. And that was very exciting because, you know, they were big stars at that time, and I was just starting. But it ends up there in Billboard magazine. That's correct. They, they were submitted <laughs> to Billboard and they ran in Billboard. Some of my very first published pictures. Now, I, I love the story you tell in the book about Spin Magazine. And they wanted to see your portfolio. And yes. you didn't really have any. You just happened to have some photographs. And they asked you, do you happen to have one of George Thorogood? That's correct. Uh, they just called me and I did have this photo of George Thorogood because I had just photographed him recently. I sent it in and they published it. And that was so exciting to get one of my photographs published in you know this big, important uh, national magazine. Now, talking about big and important magazines, as the song goes, the cover of The Rolling Stone, but you then get into The Rolling Stone and it's with a photo of Madonna, and to this day, when the viewers see that photo, they're going to know, oh my God, that's the image I remember of Madonna. Thank you. Well, that was on her Virgin tour, and uh, it's the picture of her in that white wedding dress. And um, yes, that was in Rolling Stone, and that was my first photo in Rolling Stone. I happen to have loved the photo you took of Tina Turner, and I'll tell you Thank why. You. Because what, what I love about Tina is the raw energy that she has when she performs. And my gosh, when it's easy to capture that with video, but to capture raw energy with one snap, you capture it. Thank you. And that's one of the reasons that that's one of the key pictures on the cover of my first book, Rock and Roll Lens. Uh, it's really one of my all-time favorite photographs, that picture I took of Tina Turner. Wow, you can, you can see it. Now you have a story here, because it's not only rock and roll. Most of it's rock and roll, but we'll get into some of the others. Johnny Cash, and although I do think he transcends all forms of music, he's they, that great, 
But what's so good about this book is you tell interesting little stories about the artists that you encounter. And I thought the one about driving with Johnny Cash, would you mind sharing that with us? Sure. Again, a, a friend of mine in the industry uh, knew my work, and he hired me to photograph Johnny Cash. Uh, Johnny was shooting a commercial, I forget exactly what for, but I was going to be the still photographer. I was the still photographer. So we get to the hotel to pick up Johnny Cash with his entourage, and it was all private cars, and my friend said, well, you go with him, and you go with him, and, well, Johnny, you go with Jimmy. So Johnny gets in my car, and I'm driving, and we're driving to the location for this shoot, and I had a little sports car, and Johnny Cash goes, man, this is smaller than June's Ferrari. <laughs> and anyway, it was, uh, you know, very exciting working with a legend. Oh, like that. The, I, and I'm sure there must have been some chatter that was a lot that you can't even talk about on TV, but I could fun. just tell that drive was phenomenal. Now, you begin to get kind of famous, let's be honest, and all of a sudden people are wanting album covers and you have to make this decision to leave Minnesota, <laughs> mm -hmm. or so cold as they call it, Minnesota, right. and come to Los Angeles, which is a big transition, yes, but yet... It was fairly quickly, you're right back in the scene again. Yeah, it was a big move, but I had established contacts here in Los Angeles and that helped. Uh, obviously, once I moved here, it was a full-time job to build the contacts up and uh, move forward in a bigger way. But yes, well, the main reason I moved to Los Angeles was to do more and more album covers as opposed to just concert photography. And eventually, my photos ended up on covers for uh, Billy Ray Cyrus, uh, Willie Nelson, uh, Miles Davis, the Red Hot Chili Peppers, and on and on. Wasn't my, it wasn't, in fact, the photo. It, it's on Miles Davis' most famous album, isn't it? Well, I don't know if it's his most famous. It's, uh, it's a live show that he did in Paris. And, um, you know, I just happened to have the photos. So it was very exciting. Oh, it is. I, but many people consider it to be the greatest one of the great albums that he, he in fact, made. Uh, uh, that's what they say, at least. So I'll, I'll leave it up to you if you decide if, if you want that. And you, I actually photographed him a couple of times. So, really? Yeah. Now, and, and again, I love the fact that I heard, and I mentioned this before on another episode, he stands to his back to the audience often. Yeah, he often did. He, it was like he was playing to his band or relating to his fellow musicians. And in fact, wasn't it... Wait, if I'm correct now in the book, don't you tell a story about your father? Isn't that how you got... It was your father that turned you on to Miles Davis. That's true. He had heard him in New York many years, you know, back in the 50s. And, uh, and my father said that when my father saw him back in the 50s, he would turn his back to the audience and Miles would play with his back to the audience some of the time. Now... Again, you, you capture so many iconic musicians. There's no way we're going to get into them, but I'm going to literally try to whittle my way down from as iconic as they get, but they can't because almost every one of them is of that nature. You have a capture, a photo of Eric Clapton, and what, again, moves me is that you can see just by this photo how much Clapton is literally in two the guitar. Thank you, and I'm glad that you recognize that. Uh, certainly Clapton is one of my favorite guitar players of all time. He's the favorite guitar player of many people. And that, that was the mission that I had every time I went to a concert, was try and get that photo that conveys to the viewer um, the musician's sort of inner self. Um, I, I hope that I did it. I, I think I've done it in many cases, and Clapton is certainly one of the greatest of all time. Another great, uh, I know you said you wanted to capture the Rolling Stones, but you end up with a picture of Keith Richards. Yes. But I have to say this, this is, this almost looks like a fan photo because he's staring right at you. And it was a very unusual way because most of the time, as you, when, you're, when people will see this, book and, and, and see your work. And by the way, they can see all of your work and even get some of your pictures if, if they go to your website. Am I correct? That's correct. If they go to jimmysteinfeld.com, they can purchase my both, either of my books. And I also have limited edition prints oh, that, that's uh, wonderful, of all these gonna, photographs. They're going to want these things because this Keith, Keith Richards, he's staring 
right at you. Yes, he is. That was shot at the Aragon Ballroom in Chicago. And he was on a solo tour. His band was called the Expensive Winos. And uh, so I photographed that show and I got many good shots, but I got that especially lucky shot of him looking right at me. And from time to time, I would get a photograph of the uh, performer looking right at me, including a picture in my book of Prince where he's looking right at me. I'm going there next because how can a boy from Minnesota not put in Prince? And that photo, in fact, if I'm correct in the book, that was like the picture right before Purple Rain, one of his most iconic albums comes out. And it's as if two Minnesotan boys mm -hmm. are just there. One in the audience and one performing to the whole world up on stage. Well, Prince you know, was simply one of the greatest performers and songwriters ever. It was just uh, my good luck that he was from my hometown and I was there when he was uh, rising up. He had been around, of course, for a while before that show, but that show, you're right, was very special. That was in 1983, and it was the first time that he performed for the public, as I understand it, the music from Purple Rain, the very first time he had performed it for the public. And you've got that picture, and so will the audience soon. This one interests me for another reason, Bono and U2. Oh, yes. And I'll tell you why. Bono is mostly thought of as, a, a, well, first of all, he is a serious, he's a wonderful musician, he's a, a great advocate for so many great causes. Yes. But what many people don't realize, and I happen to know this about him, not that I know him personally, he has a great sense of humor. And you capture a smile on his face that uh, it just sort of, you know, you don't see Bono that way, and you caught that moment. I don't know if you did it on purpose because you felt the same thing, or was it just the luck of the click? There was uh, some luck, but there was some purpose in it. I made a point all throughout my career of trying to get photographs, live concert photographs, of the musician smiling. I mean, uh, to look really cool, and rock and roll is really cool, and people like to be cool, sometimes you get a kind of a hard, cold stare but I would wait for those moments when they, the musicians would smile. And I would always try and get some pictures of them showing, let's say, the warmer side of these uh, famous rock and rollers. Oh, you know, it's so funny. I, that you don't say in the book, but that's what I was feeling as I was going through the pictures and reading your words, but it was the pictures. You get a sense of knowing them two ways. One is the iconic photos that people will recognize, and the other is on a more personal level. So you, you, you go for both styles, I guess. That's true. And the other thing that I did throughout my career is uh, I would try and get at least a few photographs of everybody in their band, including, you know, the lesser known uh, players. And, um, and that wasn't easy because, you know, in the old days, all of these were shot on film and there's only 36 pictures per roll. And then you had to you know, take out the roll and put in a new roll, and you didn't uh, have that much time. You, you weren't usually allowed to shoot an entire concert. So for me to dedicate myself to getting some photos of the, uh, well, the Michael Jackson photo on the cover of this book here. Oh, by the way, talk, wait, talk about iconic. Mm -hmm. Obviously, that, w w I, it, on the book you see your title on it, but I'm showing right. the actual picture of it, and Very it good. is, that's the photo that everyone knows of Mike. When they think of Michael Jackson, that's the photo. Thank you. In his band was Sheryl Crow so, uh, on that tour. And so I have some pictures of Sheryl from that show. Not many, but I have some because I, like I say, I was dedicated to try and get pictures, even though I was thinking all the time, well, I'm not going to have a chance to shoot Michael Jackson again. And I concentrated on getting great photos of him, but I knew... I want to get photos of all of his players, and I did that throughout my career. And Cheryl Crow, didn't you say she was a teacher, in fact? And, and yes, that's true. She, uh, she was a school teacher at an earlier part of her career, and then, of course, went on to great fame, and uh, she's one of the really, truly great songwriters. Something else you do I want to discuss, as again, is still photography, but yet, and, and I don't know how you do this. I, well, I guess it's part of the way photo photography itself is, but there's a shot of Rod Stewart, and what you see is this immense 
energy with his hands, mm -hmm. and yet a stillness in his face. And the juxtaposition of energy and motion and stillness to me is a fascinating photograph just by that nature. Thank you. I tried frequently to introduce motion into my still photography uh, by using a slower shutter speed. Now, I couldn't use it too often or all my photos would be um, you know, blurry, but that's one that just worked out perfect. His, his head was still for just that 60th of a second, and, um, but his hands were moving. So you, you saw motion and excitement in his movement, but his head was still, so it's, uh, it's well focused. Again, I'm going back to one of my favorites who passed away way before he should have, Warren Zevon. As I say his name, I just want to go send lawyers, guns, and money. And I, again, I just, when you, when you love a man and then you see the photograph and you feel this connection, I think that's what makes the photography so beautiful, is not just the image. It's when the viewer can feel the connection and that's what so many of your photos do. You feel the connection with the musician. Oh, thank you. Warren is you know, one of many that I photographed that has passed away, but he is one that I think about frequently. I think about Warren really all the time. Um, I miss him. Uh, I know the world misses him. He wrote some wonderful and, and bizarre songs. He was a very creative songwriter. And in that picture, he was wearing a Twins jersey, and it was the year that the Twins won the World Series. Oh, and in Minnesota, again, how, I, you can't beat that, that can you? Again, a shot that the world's going to see, and they're going to go, oh, I've seen that photo, Elton John. Now, you talk about an icon of music. Elton is one of them. And a super nice person. Um, in this book, I tell the story that um, I had photographed him in the 80s, and then he came back to town, maybe in the early 90s, to do a show, and I brought a giant uh, print that I had blown up. I wanted him to autograph it for me. I've been a fan of Elton John, really, my whole life. And I got backstage, and I unrolled the poster, and he was just about to go on stage. He had his feather you know, hat on and everything, and he came towards me, sort of delaying the show a few seconds, and autographed it for me. And you know, he could have sent the security after me, but he was uh, great, and of course he went on to do a great show. One of those, I told you about the, the Keith Richards one that I thought was kind of interesting, him looking at you. Mm -hmm. Another one that you do is The Who. Did you set that up? Because no. that almost looks like you had to have staged that photo. It was as if the three of those guys, you said, move a little closer, look at me, but that was just a spontaneous picture? Uh, sort of. That was curtain call. You know, okay. that was at the end of the show when they do their bow. So, but from with my luck, they were looking right at me for just that few. You know, they they look to the right, they look to the left, they look all. But I was ready if they looked at me. So that is another one of the rare photos where the artists were looking right at me, and I'm glad that you like that. That is a special photo to me because I photographed that in San Diego. Uh, at the very same stadium I had gone to as a young person when I was in college in San Diego. You also have what almost looks like a portrait of Paul McCartney. Yes, that's that's, right. that's a very different style, again, of, of some of the other photographs. There's almost a portrait-like quality to the Paul McCartney photo. Uh, I think one of the reasons for that, of course, is the lighting. That was uh, where there was just a very black background and he was hit with one single spotlight. And, uh, and it's, he's got his Hofner bass he's playing, and um, that's a pretty cool picture. And it does have a, a portrait-like quality. David Bowie, who recently passed, I don't know if it's prophetic or what, but the photo you have in this book of David Bowie literally has what looks like almost a halo or rays of light shining down on him as if he's about to approach the other side. That was shot at the Hollywood Athletic Club right here in Los Angeles. And that is probably my most popular photograph that I have as a limited edition print. It, 
I'm, I'm very proud of that photograph. It does have that otherworldly quality because of the rays of light. I want to tell viewers too, the, the, you, you specialize in these beautiful color photo books, but I want to hold up something and I want to talk about an artist that's in this. You also s offer a, if a person can't afford the big colored photos, they can actually get so many beautiful black and white photos. And in this particular one called Rock and Roll Lens Volume 2, um, I, I don't know if I held it up good enough. Let me just hold it up so the Thank viewers can Barry. really see it if it's okay. Thank and uh, what I loved about this was you had other writers write about their experiences with the artists. And the one photo I want to take from this book is Richie Havens. I had the privilege of having Richie Havens on Between the Lines. And I have to tell you something. When people ask me about my favorite guests and all of that, I, I, I never say which ones are my favorite. I have so many that I love, and, and they're all so wonderful. But there's no doubt, and I wonder if you'd experience this as well, when Richie Havens is in your presence, it feels like a transcendent presence is with you. I agree. I only met Richie Havens once and only photographed him once. Not only did I photograph him on stage, alive, but he allowed me, when we were backstage, to shoot a portrait of him. Uh, that picture is not in this book. It's more of the live shot. But he was very kind, and he just sat there and played his 12-string guitar. You know, he played it backwards, and right. how he made music out of it uh, was just a wonder. Oh, but the photo in this book is not that story, but there is a beautiful Havens photo in this there book. There is. There's a beautiful Richie Havens photo from that day, that from same that day. day. Oh, got it. But it was special that he would, uh, you know, be especially nice to, he'd never met me before, and he said, yes, Jimmy, come and we'll, you can do a portrait of me backstage. And I wanted to do something with this new book that's black and white photography. I wanted to do something different, because, you know, artists, we like to do something different each time out of the box. I did a color photo book, which we've talked about, but I wanted to do a book of black and white photography, but I didn't want to just tell my story again. My stories are in the first book. So I called all these people that I know in entertainment and I said, might you have a story about Bruce Springsteen or ACDC or Richie Havens? And 50 people, 50 wonderful friends and acquaintances in the industry each wrote a story, one for each of the 50 pictures in the new black and white book. Now we've been talking a lot about rock and roll and as I said, we did mention Johnny Cash, but yes. some legends. You have the legendary guitar player, Les Paul. And when I say guitar yes. player, I mean the guitar inventor. That's he correct. invented the electric guitar, the Les Paul guitar that virtually every guitar player uses. It's just that simple. Uh, he was amazing. I always wanted to photograph him from the very beginning of my career. He didn't tour that much, but thankfully he came and played at the uh, House of Blues in Los Angeles. And I was able to photograph him there and meet him. He actually autographed a guitar for me. I brought a guitar one of my guitars, and he autographed it for me. You captured also Frankie and Sammy. Oh, yes. Now again, we talk about legends, but not of rock and roll by any means. And this, and, and, and you know, I think you said you wanted to capture the Rat Pack, and yet G Dean Martin wasn't in the photo. And you That's almost correct. get the sense that the way they're spaced apart, somebody's missing. Yes. That's a really special photo for me. And uh, there is the, Frank is on one side and Sammy's on the other, and there's this big empty space in between them. And uh, yeah, I'd like to think that Dean, you know, could have been there or should have been there. Um, and I always wanted to photograph uh, the Rat Pack, so at least I got to photograph Frank and Sammy, and that was pretty exciting. And two older legends that you capture here, John Lee Hooker and Cab Calloway. And John Lee Hooker is so influential, it's unbelievable. And Cab Calloway, that beam on his, mm -hmm. you talk about the happiness and joy. Those are, you know, two of the legends of sort of more old school uh, music. And one of the things that I always wanted to do in my uh, photography career was not photograph just rock and roll. 
if someone famous in blues music came to town, I wanted to go photograph it. Um, if somebody, well, we talked about Frank and Sammy earlier. I mean, they're from the jazz era, if you will. I wanted to photograph them. I even photographed Pavarotti. Um, I wanted to photograph all forms of music, even though the books are called Rock and Roll Lens, and I mostly photograph rock and roll people. Um, yes, uh, John Lee Hooker was one of the greatest ever, and Cab Calloway, when I heard he was coming to town, I didn't even think he was alive. I mean, he's like from my grandmother's era, and, and he was terrific and, uh, and still in very good form. Well, Jimmy, one day, I want to be on a picture with Jimmy. You are fantastic. Thank you we'll so much it. for joining us today. And thank you guys for joining us. Now, before Jimmy leaves, I'd like to leave you with these few more words from Jimmy Steinfeld's Rock and Roll Lens. When you photographed musicians over and over for 30 years, you get to know them on a more personal level. I wanted to share some of the funny, endearing, or even embarrassing encounters I had with those artists. I'm Barry Kibrick. Between the art of the performer and the art of the photographer, there are pictures, words, and sounds that all make up the music of our life. Thank you so much, Jimmy. Thank you, Barry. It was an honor. My pleasure. To connect with Barry, like him on Facebook and follow him on Twitter at Barry Kibrick. And to contact Barry directly, view past episodes of Between the Lines, and read his weekly blog, visit us at barrykibrick.com.